Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, last, and actually it's a bonus, really special bonus energy seminar for this quarter. Uh, and our speaker today is Jim Brainerd, who I just met, uh, but I've been reading uh, a lot of background material on him since a few weeks ago when Leon Min, the managing director of the Bits and Watts Initiative here at Stanford, recommended him as a really, really good speaker for our audience here and uh, online. Uh, reading through uh, uh, Jim's background, uh, I think I did this with Sarah Carney saying he, she uh, kind of invented impact investment before it was called impact investment. I think in Jim's case, I was told maybe 10 or 15 years ago that the cities were the action on climate change policy and uh, uh, sustainability. And I actually didn't believe that. And then I was visited by a few people from big cities. Reading Jim's bio, I think he started working on this about 30 years ago. So he was literally way, way ahead of his time. And he's going to tell us today a uh, tale of three cities, which I assume is different levels of development in, in uh, Carmel, Indiana, where he's from, in, in a blue, a purple district, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Purple yeah. district in a, in a uh, red state, can I call it? Well, it used to be 50-50. Today, I'm not so sure. Yeah, so. yeah. So he's actually taken the city through this sequence of urban renewal, urban renewal into sustainability, and now evidently the net zero uh, greenhouse gases or full sustainability thing. Uh, as the social science part of me says this is ideal because usually what you don't have is longitudinal observations. That is one single case or industry or uh, city where you have good data over a long period of time. So we have here embodied in Jim, kind of 30 year, I, I think before you got into politics, politics, you were already interested in these kinds of things. So without further fanfare, I'd like to introduce Jim to tell us his story before I totally ruin it by trying to do it for him. Thank you, Jim. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. Thank you. See, my, I don't need the hand mic apparently, so. So, Carmel, Indiana. Um, when I became mayor in 1996, it was a city of about 20-some thousand people. Today it's over 100,000 people, so it's had a tremendous amount of population growth. What I want to do today, though, is talk a little bit about how cities in general have changed. And so the tale of three cities, um, it's Carmel's story, but it's also the story of car suburbs all over the United States and to some extent in Europe and other places too. And to understand what we did wrong, I think we have to look back in an interdisciplinary way at how cities were built before cars, and then what we did wrong the last 70 some years, and then where we're headed. So those, those are the three cities. So think about our cities we, in the last 120 years. At the close of World War II, 19, August of 1945, we still had not achieved 25% car ownership in the United States. Only one out of, fewer than one out of four households had an automobile. And so our cities were still built for pedestrians for the most part. Some of the big cities had some public transit, but generally people were able to walk or ride a bike uh, most places that they needed to go on a daily basis. Go back a few more years. Uh, well, and so what shape were our cities in, in 1945? Well, first of all, there hadn't been, when, when did there, anybody know the Depression? October, started in October of 1929. There hadn't been any building really since then. There have been tremendous amounts of immigration into the United States because of World War II, and the rest of the world was in a depression as well, and we were still a lot better than a lot of other places. Um, Antibiotics have been invented, but they we hadn't figured out how to mass produce them yet, so they were just pretty much used for our soldiers during the war. Uh, and every house, still generally in the cold areas, had a coal 
furnace in the basement. If you go look back at traditional areas throughout the United States, you still see that in the older houses built before 1945, 1950, you'll see that a place where the coal would have been dumped in from a truck every couple weeks, set in a big pile in the basement. Whoever was in the house would shovel it into the furnace at night. It would heat up the house, and the fire went out. You go put more coal in the house. Terrible uh, way to pollute cities. I remember going uh, to, to large cities as a child in the 1960s, and. Uh, washing my face and hands at the end of the day and asking my mother, you know, why, why is the sink black? What's all this on my, you know, what's all this is coming as coal dust? Uh, so our cities were overcrowded, they had lots of disease, and they were dirty. We also had this theme running through American history, starting with Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, about the U.S. being agrarian, small crafts uh, shops, farmers, without all the, uh, the problems of the big European cities. And it was just themes around American history that encouraged, um, that was really anti-city in many ways. So you think about the end of World War II, Asia was in shambles from the war, Europe was in shambles, our industrial might was untouched. So the average working person uh, was probably better off in the U.S. There was a recession after, there was usually a recession after a war as soldiers come back and there aren't enough jobs. Um, but we really didn't have much of one after World War II because we needed to go to work to supply Europe and Asia to help them rebuild. And, and so the average working person was making more money than ever, they were crowded. It's like, let's, we can afford, cars were inexpensive, gas was particularly inexpensive. Uh, and so let's move out into the suburbs. Uh, Levitt towns in New Jersey area were started. Everybody had a little yard. But what we were doing, we were building suburban sprawl without really realizing it. We had built cities for people for millennia. Now we had automobiles and we started to build for automobiles, not people. So today the pendulum swing back. We made lots of mistakes. The average, a study that shows the average American spends two hours a day in their automobile. The average adult spends two hours a day in their automobile. And that includes, it's an average, that includes all the people in the big cities that don't have cars and don't drive. So there's lots of people spending three or more hours in their cars. They may be ability to, to afford a house they want for their family that's a long way from where they work, which is a higher rent district. Uh, but we have built our cities. Well, what sort of quality of life is that? You're spending three hours a day in an automobile. And that's because of poor city design. And so when I first ran for mayor back in 1995, I knocked on lots of doors and asked people what their hopes and desires and aspirations were for the place they had decided to call home. And I kept in a thousand different ways. I heard, I wish we could walk somewhere we needed to go, a useful walk. Uh, I wish. You know, I could walk to the stores, I could walk to dinner. Uh, I wish there wasn't so much traffic congestion. I wish I didn't have to drive to the neighboring big city uh, to see a show or, or to do things. I wish I could walk to places near my house or make short drives. I wish I were in the car less. So we started to analyze why our cities were were not being built. Anybody go for a romantic walk past the Walmart parking lot lately? <laughs> Think about that. Uh, of course not. So how do we design our cities to look more like the old beautiful European cities, cities on other continents were built pre-automobile? Because think of the energy. We're building our cities so that people have no choice but to use all sorts of fossil fuels every day because they have to. Um, most of our suburbs, and remember, just because someone lives in a large city doesn't mean that they're not living in a suburban sprawl development pattern. 70% of American households live in what we would call suburban sprawl, big lot houses, single use zoning. But you know what single use zoning is? It's where the land use laws say you can only do one thing on this land. And it made sense in the 1900s when this started. It's called Euclidean zoning. And the city planners are one big victory. 
They figured out that if they moved all the houses away from the noxious factories we had back around the 1900s, that longevity would increase. And when about 20 year period increased by almost 15 years by doing that. So it was a huge victory, but we kept doing it. We no longer had to. So now all the houses are here, all the stores are here, the offices you work in are over here, uh, downtown's over here. Uh, you can't walk to a corner market to buy bread or milk. Uh, you can't walk, in fact, anywhere you need to go. You can go out for a walk. Uh, our houses changed instead of having front porches in many places, moved up close to the street where you can talk to people on the sidewalk. Uh, now you have what's called a snub nose garage where all you see is a garage sticking out at the street. You might not even know your neighbors uh, here besides on either side of your house or across the street. Uh, and that's important too, this town square idea was a Roman forum or a New England town square. You know, we're a country made up of people from all different places and it's important for our body politic. Uh, I think that there are building the city design are places where people can come together and get to know people from different backgrounds, different experiences. That's very important to our uh, form of government. Sitting inside a car doesn't allow for social interaction. Maybe a little bit if you're illegally te testing, I suppose, while you're stopped in traffic, but that would be it. Uh, so we really changed how we built our cities. We had all the suburban sprawl. We, and some of the congestion was created you know, in the middle part of the country. We had farm to market or county roads are called different things in different places, but there were, it was a mile grid. It was basically for farmers just to take goods uh, to the small towns nearby. But yet in a city, we traditionally had a block every 500 feet, four to 500 feet. So in a mile, 5,280 feet in a mile, you might have 10 roads. But yet in these suburban areas that had been former rural areas, now we had a road every mile. And, and so do we really need that to be a 10 lane road to carry the same amount of traffic? And we've also created this system because separating all the uses where people were in their cars way too much of the time. So, why were we building our cities like this? How do we change our suburban areas to make them more pedestrian friendly, uh, still accommodate cars, but start designing for people? Cut down on the amount of time people are in a car. Are in a car. So we found not only is this better for the environment, but it's much better uh, for a variety of reasons. So that's our little old downtown that all the buildings you see there were public-private partnerships, which is how we uh, figured out how to get around the legal and financial hurdles of not building everything to look like the big box parking lot. So I talk about these things around the country and different places, and I will start with this slide. You probably know where that is, Coronado Island looking over at San Diego, and you know it's 72 because it's always 72, and beautiful sailboats, palm trees, mountains, ocean. And I say, this is not Carmel, Indiana. Then the next slide, I say, this isn't Carmel, Indiana either. Nor is that, I think that's somewhere near Mendocino up in this area. I said, on the other hand, that's our palette. That's what we have uh, to work with. Then I say, they had the same palette. Lousy weather, no mountains and no oceans, and they built a beautiful city. We can do the same thing. And so many of our suburban areas are growing quickly. This is important that we think about how these suburban areas grow. So that is not Carmel either, but that's what we're trying to avoid. Nobody goes for a romantic walk past that. Nobody walks past that period. That's one of my favorite pictures to talk about how we <laughs> approach walkability. Now think exactly what's happening in this slide. These guys are paying money to go get on a Stairmaster, but yet they're taking the escalator to get there. Uh, but it's a philosophy we have in this country. That, of course, on the left, say if you're in a wheelchair, that's not gonna work out very well, is it? That's how some engineers, utility engineers in particular, uh, treat pedestrianism. You see this all over the country. Uh, we have to do better than that. Then look at the houses on the right. 
Say you'd had a beer or two, would you even get in the right house? And they all had the snub nose garages. Um, you can't walk anywhere you need to go. You can't walk to a corner store. Um, that is not the type of neighborhoods we should be building. So there's Carmel's downtown. It was founded as a little Quaker community back in the 1830s. I did not grow up there like most people that live there because it's grown so quickly. Um, the downtown pretty much had gone away. It had a couple stores in it. It was abandoned. When I first ran for office in 1995, I asked people where the downtown area was, and there was disagreement. People did not identify this little old area, in many cases, as even being the downtown. But we put up the archways. We, we're 50 square miles. That's double the size of the island of Manhattan. So we knew that little four-block area that had been a downtown for 700 people at the end of World War II. Uh, a poor agricultural community would not work. We wanted to preserve it, so we entered into a series of, we put up the archways, made it the art and design district, specialized uh, retail, brought the buildings up to the street, did a series of public-private partnerships uh, to get new buildings going in that area. And I'll talk a little bit more about the public-private partnerships and how we created a walkable, uh, more traditional uh, streetscape and city um, and, and why that doesn't happen today in most suburban areas. So that was one of the first projects we did. It's an old warehouse building that was abandoned and we uh, got a developer. We see we moved the building up to the street. We know that pedestrians feel much more comfortable if the building's close to the street and there's a line of cars parked along the street. They feel secure in that space. There's a lot of uh, research that uh, provides that uh, data. And we put up another public-private partnership, a design center that has a 120-car underground garage. So go back to this picture, that one. See all those big parking lots? Why, uh, how do you make that into a better streetscape than what it is? That's not Carmel, again, but you know, it's not pretty, it's ugly. Uh, nobody likes walking through those parking lots. They feel dangerous and open. Uh, the stores aren't architecturally interesting. They're just boxes. Why do developers build that? Why do cities allow that to be built? Requiring long car trips. They're huge stores. So that means they have to attract people from a large geographic area. The only way to get there is to drive. It just adds to this whole thing. We have to spend all this time in our cars. Um, the reason is that an underground parking spot cost about $80,000 to build. A precast uh, garage, multi-story garage, like many I see here on this campus, cost about $40,000 a spot to build. Businesses generally, unless they're in a very high land cost area, can't afford that and still make money. Oops. What did I do? There we go. So in this case, we took that old uh, liquor store and, and empty building and turned it in the design center, but all the cars are stored underground for people that go there. We also, I also have this theory that architecture got very uninteresting. It became very plain and simple about the time after World War II that we all got in cars and quit walking around looking at it. So we tried as we do these public-private partnerships to create a more traditional city, we uh, focus on interesting architecture of all different styles, but detail that is interesting to the pedestrian. There you see that we also got rid of some street parking spots and bump, got rid of those spots and allowed people to start dining in those areas long before the pandemic. Uh, bike share. There's our former mayor in the bottom left. Uh, she was in her late 80s at that point, and uh, we were doing our first bike share, and she said, you know, I don't know if I'd want to get on a two-wheel bike anymore, but I'd want to do one of those old people's bikes with three wheels, and so we got a picture of uh, Mayor Jane there on, her bike, on the uh, tricycle that we uh, have as part of our bike share program. But so many cities also don't provide. We've built 250 miles of bike trails in our city, uh, some independent trails away from roads, but many along our arterial and major roads as well 
So the idea is you can bike from any neighborhood in our 50 square miles uh, to anywhere else in the city, and particularly our downtown. Um, flip through some of these. When you're developing an urban density, small urban gardens and spaces like this become very important. Um, the building you see on the right has a two-level underground parking garage. Um, we'll talk more about that building in a minute. It has a center courtyard, there you see it. When you build at slightly higher densities, you have to pay a lot of attention to good design, public spaces, and detail in terms of public art, materials, because people are out walking and paying attention to it. You have to make it a great play, a beautiful place for people to spend time. So, get into a little bit of math here. Cities have to provide services. Uh, in most states, cities live off property tax, a tax on the value of property. So I want to go through the revenue side. Remember, there's always two sides in an income statement, revenue and expenses. Go through the revenue first. So this is that building I showed you in our new downtown, one of our public-private partnerships. The AV, that stands for assessed value, is uh, just under $51 million on 2.1 acres. Now, if you look at one of our big box stores over in the right, you'll see that it's... Um, on 20, almost 26 acres, just under 12 million an acre. So look at the difference in assessed value. Here's another example. This is, uh, again, the same building on the left, Sophia Square in Carmel, 2.1 acres, 47 million is the earlier slide, assessed value. Uh, so it's 23.5 million an acre. And you then apply that to the tax rate, whether it's one, two, or 3%. Uh, Fishers is our neighboring community to the east. Big Ikea, big box store with a huge parking lot and a top, top golf facility. Do you have those out here? You know what I'm talking about, top golf? So big parking lots. Uh, so it also has a $50 million, roughly uh, assessed value, but the value per acre is $1 million. The value in Sophia Square, the five-story European-like building that had been built forever, beautiful courtyard, nice architecture, underground parking, $23.5 million. So that provides enough revenue for the city. And when we do these public-private partnerships, we take a lot of that anticipated revenue, though, let the developer borrow against it, future property taxes for 25 years, to build that underground garage. Otherwise, you'd have to have this huge service parking lot. So that's just the revenue side of it. But there's enough money left over then to say, okay, we're helping you out, Mrs. Developer or Mr. Developer, a lot. Um, we want really good architecture. We want really good building materials. We want buildings that are going to last. We want buildings that are going to be net carbon zero in some cases. We're getting more and more towards that. We have some leverage and negotiating power as a city. Um, but that's just the revenue side. Let's talk about the expense side. Anybody know what a two-lane road, a mile of two-lane road from scratch would cost? Anybody want to guess? Five million. I wish. More than double that, about 12. About 12 million in the Midwest today. And that's a nice road, storm sewers and bike path on the side street lighting at the intersections and so on. Nice road, you might get it down to eight or nine million if you didn't have curbs and, and had ditches instead, but it's very expensive. And then you need a fire station every five miles or so, and to staff a fire station is three to four million dollars a year. You need police to patrol all these roads, and every city only has so much capital to be invested there's not unlimited capital to be invested in most cities. So you're going to get investment, you're going to get X amount, probably not much more than that amount. So if it's sprawled out 10 times farther along that road, you have to pay for the road, you have to pay for the sewers, you have to pay for the electrical wires, you have to pay uh, for water pipes, you have to police those roads. So the cost, the expense side, and that equation goes way up as well, and you sprout out, and it's there forever, basically. Um, so there's a lot of suburban areas that are doing well financially now, 
Um, but they won't be when their growth stops. They're living off the growth. And they're going to be in worse shape than the traditional cities, I think, financially, because they haven't fiscally modeled their growth out in the future. And they also haven't modeled how much carb, extra carbon. They're, it's going to be very hard for them to get to net zero carbon because of the sprawl. Um, so we had that little area that was the old village area. We went about five blocks south. That was an uh, old grocery store. And that's what sits there now. There's a public-private partnership as well. Uh, it has an underground parking garage. It's 88 acres. That's just the corner of it. Um, obviously, it's a much nicer looking building. That's what you can do you know, in these public-private partnerships. But hundreds of million dollars of investment right in our downtown area where we already had police and fire and perimeter roads and all these things. So we can afford then to get the cars underground in garages with money left over for public art, for social services, all the things that cities many times don't have money for. Uh, that's an office complex. You see the underground garage, uh, the entrance to it, it's very subtle. Uh, but again, that's a site, that's a 20,000 square foot building. There are five of them on that site. Without the underground parking, we would have had one. So our revenue went up five times. We did it in an area where we don't have to add fire or police or any perimeter roads, water and sewer are already provided to that site. Uh, we anchored uh, Indianapolis as we're, we share a border with Indianapolis where some people would say we're a suburb. I like to say we're an edge city. Uh, but uh, they'd invested a lot in amateur and professional sports, so we built a uh, concert hall. Be like, uh, it, this is, uh, of course, uh, inspired by Palladio's Villa Rotunda, which was built in the 1500s outside of uh, Venice and Vicenza, Italy. And, of course, he was inspired by the Parthenon in Rome and other classical buildings. Uh, but we built our economic development around the arts. Again, public architecture needs to be beautiful, especially if people are going to want to live in your community and walk around it. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button there. There we go. There's, there's the Villa Rotunda up in the top left, and then there's the inside of our uh, hall on the right. And of course, public spaces become very important, and that's really the center of our city. You see the, a farmer's market taking place. That's a Saturday morning when that happens. Uh, you need places, people from around the community to be able to come together and get to know each other, especially when you're building a denser, uh, uh, a denser city. There it is in the winter, a, a holiday market, ice skating. That's the way it looks today. Um, it's another project that connects those two redevelopment districts. Again, you see that small plaza. Uh, there's lots of rules about and data and evidence that shows you can't make those areas too big. People won't use them. But this area has hundreds of people on it most evenings, uh, most of the year. Um, that's a brand new street we built through that area. One of the things we learned about street design is one thing that cuts down on pedestrians and encourages people to drive is that speeds are too high. It's dangerous to walk along the street. Pedestrians don't like to do that. Lanes are generally 12 feet wide. So we made our lanes on this street about eight and a half feet wide. We found we don't even need to put up speed limit signs because no one can speed. People don't speed through, through that area. The trail is a rail to trail project, a former rail, uh, it was a, a train track up until about the 1970s, I'm told. Uh, is, is the wide uh, serpentine path in the middle. It's actually wider than the vehicular lanes on either side. And in this case, we had so much pedestrian traffic, we actually, if you look carefully, you'll see we separated the walking trail from the bike trail through this area. There it is. Um, you see the red brick on the left is actually the vehicular street, and uh, the trail is on the right, and if you were standing there, Looking at it straight on, you'd see the trail's about two feet wider than the uh, car line. Um, it's another big box store, Dick's Sporting Goods, but we didn't put a parking lot in front. At least we forced the cars to the back and built a park in front. Makes it prettier. There we go. Uh, sign pollution is also something that I think uh, 
is not good for our roads. We spend so much money on street construction. Uh, we might as well make our streets beautiful. You spend 2 to 5% more, you can make them beautiful. One of the things you can do, that's the same street uh, looking south into Indianapolis, which does not control their signs, and then looking north uh, from the same intersection into Carmel, where we don't allow off-premise signs. Now, I, apparently, one day it was blue sky and the other day it wasn't, but I don't know why that happened. Um, this is interesting. This is a five-lane street on the left that we took, what we call a suicide lane running down the middle. Uh, we had stoplights on it. I'm going to talk about roundabouts for a minute. We have built more roundabouts than any other city in the country. If you go back to the New York Times on November 21st, last year, Sunday Times, on the front page, there's an article about all the carbon savings, the tons of carbon we save, tons of carbon we save every day because people aren't idling at stoplights and they're not starting that big heavy vehicle from zero. So, you know, physics, remember your physics class takes more energy to go from zero to 15 than it does from 15 to 30. Uh, we also, so our, our safety is, is number one reason we build roundabouts. Our fatality rate is two per 100,000 per year. The national average is just under 12. We're one-sixth the national average. Uh, they're cheaper to build and maintain, but they also move 50% more cars per hour. How many times have you been in a stoplight when you're the only car there and you're sitting there idling and nobody's at any of the other three entrances and you're just sitting there? And that's what we eliminate. But speed's the big thing. Everybody, anybody in this room uh, ever speed up to go through a yellow light or a green light? I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> We all do. Even green lights, we have the data on this. People speed up because they don't want it to turn yellow or red. So they see it a block away and they, they accelerate over the speed limit to get through it before it changes. Well, human error rate never changes. So we know the possibility of a serious accident is much greater at higher speeds. At lower speeds, where everybody has to slow down at the roundabout, Somebody makes a mistake, and they will because we're humans, and humans make mistakes. It's a percentage. We know what that percentage is generally. But the percentage goes down at roundabouts because there's more time to correct a mistake. The response time is much greater. So it's better for younger drivers, for elderly drivers. It's better for pedestrians. Counterintuitive. Pedestrians sometimes say, I don't like roundabouts. I don't like stepping out in front of the traffic. But if you're hit at 15 miles an hour, you're probably going to survive. If you're hit at 50 miles an hour, you're probably not going to survive. There's a sliding scale between those two speeds. Um, but anyway, that's Range Lane Road on the left when it was five lanes with stoplights. There it is today on the right after we installed the roundabouts, cut the road, and most, most of it, down to one lane in each direction with a center median bicycle lane. And guess what? We're moving 8% more traffic per hour. But it's so much better for pedestrians. Uh, you can see buildings of different ages. There, see how some of the buildings are up to the street. That's under our new laws. Uh, previously, the buildings set back from the street, so you saw the parking lot, not the building. So that'll change over time as the older buildings are replaced. Uh, that was a state road on the left in 19, uh, early 2000s, uh, 2005, I convinced the state of Indiana they were going to add lanes to that road. We had in that, our five-mile stretch of that state-maintained road, not city road. Um, uh, we'd have an average of two fatalities a year. We replaced it with these roundabout interchange, separated grade. We didn't use tight diamonds. We have taken 40-some more houses had we used tight diamonds as opposed to the roundabouts with a tight diamond um, any civil engineers here? The tight diamond configuration, you have to keep drawing that the lights farther apart on the side. You think about the interstate exit. Those lights, they calculate how many cars are going to be queued between the light on one side and the light on the other side and keep drawing them farther apart as traffic increases. So we'd have to take a lot of houses. Uh, we took um, a fraction of the number of houses to do this at six different intersections. Uh, we haven't had a fatality. Uh, at an intersection on that street since we did this 12 years ago, almost 14 years ago now. And you can see it's much better for pedestrians too. 
sort of encourages people to walk instead of get in their car and drive somewhere. Now there's our rail to trail project. This is important for cities. You have to have options to get anywhere in the city by bike or on foot. If you don't have those options, people are going to drive. They're going to burn more carbon. It's going to make it impossible for us to get to carbon neutral. Electric cars are going to help. It's going to be a long time before we completely convert. Um, all this roundabout on the lower levels, I'll tell you a funny story. I got an um, email a number of years ago from a fellow who identified himself as president of the British Roundabout Appreciation Society. And he said, we put out a calendar every year, and we'd like you to submit some photos for our calendar. We sell the calendar. So what do you use the money for? And he never answered that question. And uh, I called him on the phone after the email. And I, it was about noon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Eastern time zone. And so I knew in England it was about 6 or 7 o'clock. And I kept hearing what sounded like pub noise in the background. And he said, and I said, where are you? He said, oh, I'm in a meeting at the pre, Roundabout Appreciation Society. I said, do you meet in a pub? And he said, of course. And I said, what do you use the proceeds for, uh, beer money? And he kind of paused and never answered that question. So I think it was a yes. Uh, but anyway, that roundabout on the bottom was on the front of their calendar that year. We bought about 9,000 copies to use as economic development, you know, hand them out to people and so on. And so those guys over in Britain got a lot of our beer, got a lot of money of ours for beer. Um, these are roundabout statistics, but it shows uh, if you look at 2004 uh, traffic fatalities, see how it's come down over the years. We already had a lot of roundabouts in 2004, but it's, it's, um, come down quite a bit since then. Then you look at some of the other Indiana cities on the list. Go over and look at Valparaiso. Uh, 24 per 100,000 versus 2.2. Accident comparisons, uh, the number of roundabouts. I, I hate charts on, on PowerPoint, but take a look at that very quickly. Um, number of roundabouts, at that point we had 141. We're 147 now, that was last year. But you see the number of roundabouts directly corresponding to the number of accidents. And even more importantly, from an energy standpoint, the amount of carbon goes down drastically in contrast to the stoplights. Um, but it's more than just the carbon saved there. It's about a lifestyle that we're building so people have the ability to live in an area where they don't have to use their car much. Maybe a couple is able to cut down from two to one. It's important for poor people, especially with the rents as high as they are today. Uh, if they can get rid of the cost of one car or maybe go down to zero cars, even in a suburban area, and lease one when they uh, need to go somewhere. Um, some of our public art, which I thought you might find interesting. Again, if you're building a pedestrian-friendly city, you need to make those walks interesting. Uh, instead of putting all the art in a sculpture park where only people are interested in it go to it, I believe in spreading it out through the community so everybody gets to experience it. Sometimes I get criticized. People say, well, you could spend that money. People need housing. They, all these poor people need things. Why are you spending money on art? That's, that's uh, not necessary. And I say, you know, you and I, usually talking to somebody who's fairly well healed, you and I can travel to the best places on earth and see beautiful things. Poor people can't. They have a right to have their community be beautiful too. But I also believe that it encourages pedestrianism. It makes that walk interesting. It's got to be a useful walk, somewhere you want to go, and it also needs to be an interesting walk. There's, uh, we put uh, sculpture in our runabouts too. That uh, Hoagie Carmichael, anybody? You guys are probably too young to know too much about Hoagie Carmichael, but he wrote the most recorded song ever back 100 years ago called Stardust. He was from Indiana. He wrote it at Indiana University in Bloomington, but there's a sculpture, a gramophone with the stars and dust coming, uh, stars and moons coming out uh, to commemorate uh, Stardust in front of our concert hall. We find the roundabouts actually work better with obstructions in the middle. You know, most people try to be nice. They see somebody coming and they're looking all over the roundabout. They're really just supposed to look to the left. We find they flow better. There's less idling if uh, they can't see across. Uh, it forces them intuitively just to look to the left of the gap, which is what they're supposed to do. 
There's more of our roundabout sculpture. So what we're trying to do to build a city that encourages less car traffic, that, that um, is pedestrian friendly, is bicycle friendly, mixed use, so that people don't have to drive long distances to go for their daily needs. We try to design for people, not cars. Hierarchy of buildings, harmony of the land and built surroundings, and that means net zero buildings too when we can. At a human scale, we, we pay attention to enclosures and how the pedestrian feels in, a, in a, a city. Pay attention to aesthetics, again, to encourage pedestrianism, not driving. Uh, and learn for thousands of years of good city design that we, we learned a lot before the car came along. Remember, we didn't get over 25% car ownership until after 1945. So this idea of building cities for vehicles is really pretty new in the scope of human history. Now, we, we've entered into a partnership with Volkswagen to study lots of our data and to we're their test city worldwide. We have 600 some cameras in public spaces. We blur out faces and license plates uh, for privacy purposes. Um, one of the Volkswagen leads on this was be with us today, but he ended up being hospitalized. So I am going to try to talk about his portion of this. He was going to be with us virtually, uh, but can't be. So you. You saw the suburban sprawl, which is typical of lots of cities built in the last 75 years. You've seen what we have done differently than most suburbs. Now I want to talk about where we go in the future as a suburban city. And think about this, our suburbs in many ways, where 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the U.S. population lives in what we consider suburban sprawl uh, development pattern. How are we going to fix this? Where do we go in the future? How do we fix the sprawl, and at the same time, reduce our carbon emissions, our energy use. So this is an open data platform that we're using. Uh, we use all these cameras. They're, we're almost getting to the density where a suburb can have decent public transit. So many times, I think, when, um, when um, cities first put in public transit, they look for a busy street, they buy a bus, they hire a bus driver, and the bus runs up and down that street. It may work, it may not. They're not, they're basing it mainly on apocryphal information, what they think will work. They're not basing it on data, generally speaking. Uh, so we're going to have more data than almost any other city has when we institute uh, public transit in a few years. We're getting to the point where we have enough density in our downtown area. It'll never work in the areas with large lot subdivisions, but in our downtown area it'll work. We have a 150 corporate headquarters and move people around in those areas. Eventually connect to Indianapolis's public transit system, uh, which isn't very good, quite honestly, but eventually we'll connect. But first we're going to do this internal to Carmel uh, system. Um, so every camera has been turned into an analytical source, enhanced public safety and emergency response services. Let's talk that, about that for a minute. Let's say an ambulance driver is on the way to a run, and there's an obstruction a mile ahead. The ambulance driver can't see it yet, but he's eventually going to have to reroute, or there's traffic congestion. Well, if the cameras are talking to each other and can send a message to that driver, they can avoid that area. Hit and run driver. Uh, well, they're going to help the person that's been injured, uh, and somebody else is running away, if the cameras can talk to each other in real time and then talk to a human, the police know where to go find that person that's running away. Um, fire truck on the way to a fire, same thing. If there's obstruction up ahead, there's traffic up ahead, uh, what's the best route to get that truck, that piece of equipment to where it needs to be? Um, so we, we went out to our employees with Volkswagen and said, all the way to the lowest level employees, how would you use all this data that we're going to acquire? And it was amazing. Some of the guys that you know worked in sewers and picked up dead animals every day off the street had great ideas. The dead animal guys said, we have four people that go out every day, find roadkill, and then they remove it. Um, it was not laying on the road. All cities do this, I think. 
Um, they say, you know, if those cameras could tell us where those dead animals were, three of us could probably get other jobs. I think they were looking for better jobs. Uh, I would be. Uh, and I thought, that's a great idea. What if the cameras could identify that? What if a camera could identify a branch that's come down on the streets blocking traffic? What if a storm sewer is blocked and it's raining and there's a flood because that sewer is not draining properly? All these things are done, you know, we wait for the public to call it in or a city employee is out driving around, they may see it. Um, we can help generate carbon credits by tracking zero emission journeys. Um, we, you know, there's a, a private market for carbon credits that's developing. Um, California is ahead of the game on this. Europe's been doing it for some time. Um, but if we can have data that proves carbon savings through investments that the city makes, we do those in partnerships with private companies, those credits can be actually become a source of revenue then for the taxpayers. Um, you know, as we go to autonomous driving, a lot of these cameras will be used probably at some point uh, for autonomous driving. There's going to be two models where a private company owns the data, and you can imagine all the issues with that, uh, privacy issues and so on, or the taxpayers can own it through their local government. And I'm an advocate that the taxpayers ought to own it. So we would retain full ownership and control of the data. Um, there are some ideas that uh, popped up. Uh, and we're still coming up with, with uh, we have about 80, 80 potential applications uh, from the data that we're obtaining with Volkswagen through our cameras. Didn't realize these popped up later. Um, one of the things I think government in particular so many times makes decisions, really important decisions, that cost the taxpayers tremendous amounts of money. Um, they're not doing anything wrong particularly, except they're making the decisions based on emotion, not data, because there's a dearth of data available to these decision makers. So our camera project with Volkswagen will allow us to make better decisions, be able to cut down, design the best city that we can to get to that net carbon zero. Uh, there's examples of what some of the camera shots look like that they're analyzing in uh, the Volkswagen headquarters in northern Germany. Um, but this is done 24-7, computer analysis and sometimes visual. They're looking at uh, one of the things we're doing at our intersections. We, we know our fatality rate's really low compared to almost any other city anywhere. Uh, but we're now looking for near miss misses to make better improvements. and you'd have to put somebody at every intersection doing that visually for a long time, but the cameras can do it. They can tell us, based on good programming, uh, where those near misses are occurring, and then we can focus on that intersection. Oops, there, there we go. Visualization of the data based on observed objects. And we're not limited, see, pedestrians, are seen too, as well as bicyclists. And that's important, as one of our runabouts. But this is how the technology works. So, in conclusion, to summarize, we're trying to build a city for a variety of reasons that people have choices where they live. Um, we know there's a lot of reasons to build walkable, pedestrian-friendly cities. Carbon emissions are one of them. Uh, economic development's one. We have a shortage of workers in this country until all the people in the baby boomer generation, like me, die off, we're going to have this imbalance. We're still using lots of services and goods. There's not enough people to do the work. Uh, there's a lot of statistical data that, that shows it's going to continue for another 25, 30 years. Uh, 
The only way to fix that is with immigration. Uh, that's another lecture. But, but uh, I'm in favor of, of, of that, but we're not doing that as a country. Uh, so cities are in this competitive race. Uh, people in the best and brightest, right? I've got 150 corporations uh, headquartered in Carmel. If they can't hire and attract the best and brightest people from the best universities around the globe, they're not going to expand in Carmel, Indiana, they're, and, they're, and they may leave. Uh, so we've got to build a beautiful city that competes with the best cities on the globe. Uh, one way, one piece of that is, is um, a clean city, uh, a city that has uh, good air quality. Uh, people are concerned about the environment. They're concerned about carbon emissions. That's a part of the piece. Uh, but we got to make it a beautiful city. We got to make it pedestrian friendly to cut down on people just getting their cars and driving places. And we have designed, we've done a terrible job uh, as a society in designing our cities for the last 75 years. I think the pendulum is starting to swing back to design uh, efficient cities. We've known since ancient civilizations that to be successful, whether it's an empire or a country or a city, you got to move people and goods around safer, safely and efficiently. And that's what we're doing. We know that people have choices where they're going to live, where they're going to choose to raise their families and spend their careers. So we've got to build a beautiful, workable city. And a big piece of that is building a city where people don't have to spend the U.S. average of two hours in their car every day. And there's health reasons. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was governor, had a public health commissioner named Richard Jackson taught at UCLA and then finished up his career at Berkeley, wrote a book, Urban Sprawl and Public Health. We know if people walk just 10 minutes a day, obesity rates go down by 35%. Overweight rates go down by a similar amount. He has a great book. You ought to read this book sometime in your spare time. Uh, it's um, chock full of data. Notre Dame gave him their dry house prize for authoring it. Uh, another good book to read would be uh, Jeff Speck. He he's, uh, teaches part-time at Harvard. Uh, he used to run the uh, uh, Country's Endowment for the Arts. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Suburban City, Rise of Sprawl and Decline of the American Dream. He's followed it up with two other books, Walkable City uh, and Walkable City Rules. All three of those I recommend. Um, we, we need to rethink how we design our cities if we're ever going to get to net carbon zero. Um, and hopefully this has uh, helped you think about some of these issues. Anybody have any questions, yeah. complaints? Usually when I'm in Carmel, I said, we miss anybody's trash? Do we have <laughs> miss anybody's what? Trash, pickup. Oh. Usually when I'm speaking locally, somebody has a complaint. We have a few minutes There's left one. for questions, so please free to speak up. Sure. Um, I'm, for the record, I'm from the Midwest, too. I'm from Minnesota. Where are you from? I'm from Egan, Minnesota. So okay. it kind of looks like the giant Costco pictures you had up there. But I'm kind of wondering how we can take this model and apply it to the whole country because it almost feels permanently, like, expanded and spread out. So would that require people to move from the suburbs back into, you know, central areas, or what would that require? I don't think that's the way it's going to play out. I think it's a matter of education. Uh, example, hopefully Carmel serves as a good example. Um, education of city planners, educated of people, education of people in elected positions that make land use decisions, investment decisions. Uh, you know, representative government's a hard form of government, but we've got to take this. This isn't going to be something that can be mandated from the federal government. It's going to have to be done community by community, basically through education, discussion, and uh, examples. And it's going to be a long haul. I mean, it's not going to happen questions? overnight. But that's why it's important for people like you who are going to be leaders in your communities to understand city design is a huge Could part. Back when um, um, we thought we were going to be, the U.S. was going to leave the Paris Climate Agreement, the mayors, I'm active in the U.S. Conference of Mayors Group, which is a national association of mayors, we got together and started doing the math and realized that we could meet the U.S. goals, which probably aren't aggressive enough, but we could meet those goals if the cities just banded together and did the right things over the next 10, 15 years. 
fortunately, we're back in the treaty, but um, we're never out. We just given notice we we're going to go out under the last president. But um, cities can make a huge impact. I think it's got to be done at the local level. There's a, sometimes it's nice to have a good national partner too. I don't, don't, there's some national standards that need to be be uh, set, but a lot of the hard work has to be done at the local level. Yeah. So this is a, a little more of a, a specific question, but I was really interested by the financing mechanism that you yes. were talking about for the undergrounding of the parking. Yes. Could you go into just yeah, one or two I, more I sentences can. on that? Yeah. California has a similar law, state by state, but it's, it's what we, the acronym is TIF. That stands for Tax Incremental Finance. Okay. And so what happens is we, have, we set a base here, that our Redevelopment Commission, most cities have something by a similar name, uh, sets that base year, and then the increase in taxes in the next 25 years goes into a separate pot. And then that pot, the anticipated revenue, you can borrow against it. Sometimes the developer borrows against it, sometimes the city does it, sometimes the city backs it up. Every transaction is a bit different. Then that money is used to pay for that underground parking or that parking structure that otherwise wouldn't have been economical, never would have been built because it's not economical and the developer couldn't have made any money. Uh, it's particularly true in areas where land cost is very low. In a big city where the land cost is a lot, yeah, it makes sense to put the, maybe it can be done independently, but in most of the country, it can't be. Uh, we take our parking garages and face them with housing and businesses as well, so they're beautiful and it's not walking past a boring parking garage for a whole block. Again, it goes against that interesting walk idea. Um, so we make sure, I saw some on campus today and it wasn't an interesting walk because all you saw was a row of cars inside a garage. If there had been housing placed on the outside of that parking garage or a building, it would have been a much more interesting walk along that block. So we try to do that. Um, so that's, that's how we do it. That's the financial hurdle. It takes a partnership. So we, we set up the district. We have to take that money and segregate it. We have to enter into a project agreement with the developer. Each one is independently negotiated. That's why a lot of suburban areas and cities aren't using these tools, because they're complex and, and hard, quite honestly. But we insist on it. We've done about 70 of those transactions now in our downtown area in the last 20 some years. And has it gotten easier to do those as yes. you've developed some yeah. institutional knowledge about how that happens? Absolutely. And have the private parties also developed some confidence mm -hmm. in this, no, working with Carmel itself? It was interesting when we first started it, I talked to the developer, and developers, as long as they make a reasonable profit, they'll do anything you want them to, generally. They just want to make money and build something nice, and they want to be proud of it. And they, I get them all excited about it, they go away, and about six weeks later, they come back and say, we can't do it. After a while, I realized it was the lenders saying no. So I started to say, okay, I will meet with you, but only if you bring your banker with you. And then we actually did some seminars for the lenders. And once the lenders understood the city's policy was behind, you know, we weren't going to let this fail. We were going to be there as partners to make sure it didn't fail. We we're going to build a competitive city, a beautiful city. Then the lenders, now there's a line of people trying to do transactions with us. Looks like we maybe have one last question up here. Uh, hi, Mayor Brainerd. Uh, my name is Will. I'm actually from Volkswagen and may know the tech lead that <laughs> has unfortunately not shown up today. So my question to you is, um, especially on this issue of data privacy, um, I think this is a pretty hairy topic for, for most folks who live in the U.S., of course, Europe as well, right? Because when this topic com comes up, um, you start to think of this um, positive and negative like box where you gotta check like a positive you can use data to you know improve the lives of every everyday citizens right on the negative it intrudes up upon privacy. Um, so how would you characterize the sort of the political climate over in Indiana and how um, it's accepted or treated the over there? privacy the folks from Europe were very concerned about it when we started the project and so they said we under our laws, we have to block out the faces and the license plates. I said, that's fine. Think about it. I'm a lawyer by training, and one of the things you learn in law school is there's no expectation of privacy in a public place. 
you have an expectation of privacy in a private home or a privately owned building, but when you're on a public street, you're in public. If somebody can take a picture of you and you can't really stop it, then uh, harassment's a different issue, but just somebody taking a picture, there's no ex you can't control that. The police patrol our public streets to keep people safe. The cameras are simply an extension of what government does in these public spaces. So if, if we're looking for criminals through one of our cameras, it's an extension of the police. We could hire more police officers to do it, or we could use a camera. It really doesn't change it. It's probably a more efficient way to patrol our streets. Um, but legally, and, and a few people have asked me about it, uh, and I've explained it in that way, and I, I haven't had any serious complaints. Um, I think that would be the case through most of the country. I think people know that when they're in a public area, they're, they have no pr really privacy rights if, if they're in a public area. And they're in their home. You know, if we had one of our cameras looking in somebody's living room, that's a totally different story. That would be illegal. Yeah, I mean, that's good to know because I think one of the points that stops a lot of people from wanting to participate in the overall Smart City Initiative, right, because, you know, Naturally, you might think this is a good cause um, to, to contribute towards either on the software side or through other means, right? Um, but there is, I think, a general, like, maybe unwarranted fear over this yeah. privacy issue that's stopping a lot of people. So thank you for touching on that subject. I, I think, too, that we need to make sure it's used responsibly. If it were abused, I think there'd be more pushback, and there, as there should be, probably. So we don't use it to write tickets for people running through, well, we don't have many stoplights left, but if we did, we don't use it for that. We use it to go back and look for criminals for serious crime. We don't enforce traffic violations off of it like some of the European countries do. Um, I, I think it's, you know, I, I point out to people that do have concerns about it, this is controlled by people you elect. If you don't like the way it's being used, just need to elect new people. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, speaking of, I can't resist this. I, I, I wonder, uh, since you're such a tremendous resource on this subject, if there is a way you can leverage this. I know you're on various boards and panels with mayors in the U.S. and abroad, but I do wonder on the federal side, since the current transportation sector is is also a Hoosier, yes. who I think you know, if yes. there's any way you can use him, even if he just sends you around to the cities, but it sounds like uh, you may be able to kind of through him uh, disseminate some of these tricks of the trade that you were t talking to Fletcher about in this last question as well. Federal Highway has some incentives for roundabout construction right now. Uh, Pete, Peter Judge, came to Carmel the first month he was mayor, and I convinced me, I grew up near South Bend where he was mayor, two hours north of where I am now, and I convinced him to build some roundabouts, at least I'm going to take credit for that. And uh, it went over very well for him, I think. So he's familiar with what we've done, and uh, as are many of his staff. Uh, I, I don't know if he knows our most current statistics. I think I probably need to update him at Yep. Somebody else had asked that question today and it thought, I probably should do that. Right. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, with that said, uh, we're totally out of time, but thank you so much for that inspiring talk. We're really hoping to see you more in the future. I understand you have some family out in the I Bay do. Area, so anytime you want to stop by, feel free to give us a call and we'll do a good job hosting you. As we get out of COVID, we can do a more cordial job at that, I believe. So thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.